back and welcome back to the Horror Master YouTube channel and yes I have finally have another CD collection update for you guys this is CD collection update number 18 which I can't believe we've been doing this for 18 videos already and um, I have gathered so many CDs that I'm actually gonna split this update into two parts this is CD collection number 18 and hopefully in a week or so I'll be giving you CD collection update number 19 since my trip to San Antonio, getting things from eBay, Amazon, Discogs has gathered so much that I cannot do this entire thing in one whole video. Now I will be here the entire fucking day. But you know, if you've all seen me on my Instagram, which if you're not having follow me on Instagram, go follow me on my Instagram and see what I have. But if you haven't followed me, go give me a follow. But let's get into the goodies this time. And we're gonna start off with a bit of a, a good one. We're gonna start off with Aerosmith's Get a Grip. This, of course, this is their 11th studio album released somewhere in 1993. And I gotta say, this to me is the last quote unquote classic Aerosmith album, just with that sound. Because after those, after this album, the other albums afterwards, they were really the same. But this album has so many hits and so many great hidden gems. Of course, the hits, Living on the Edge, personally, my favorite song of the album. Cried. I mean, though that music video, uh, crazy, um, get a grip, the title track. I mean, ever since one of those bands that has has roots in rock and roll, and I'm sorry, I I'm gonna call it Greta Van Fleet to say I am sorry, Greta Van Fleet. I love you guys. But you are mostly more influenced by Led Zeppelin than you are from Aerosmith. Like, even come out, even the fucking sound. But um, this is one of my per personal favorite Aerosmith albums. I still need to get a lot more Aerosmith, especially the classic stuff. And who knows? Maybe I might get some of the modern stuff. But a uh, perfect way to start uh, getting into more Aerosmith with Get a Grip. Next up, we have a trifecta of album. This time from the band Eight Vermin. This is a uh, sludge doomy band from north carolina which they've been inspired bands like electric wizard black sabbath and I had the opportunity to see them live back like a month ago and you know what i was there and might as well bought everything of course from their debut album sonic monolith their ep arctic noise and their latest album that was released a month uh, about two weeks ago called and pronounce and forgive me if, if i don't pronounce this right andromeda's colossus I guess something like that and like I said I had a chance to meet the guys after the show they were nice enough to sign all my CDs all three of them and the best way I can describe like I said a Berman is if you like the sludgy doomy stoner album which a lot of bands that I'll be getting to have been kind of into that sub genre but the best way I could describe a Berman is their heavy as hell they're like one of the loudest bands have not the loudest band I've seen live but just the, the bass alone makes you want to fucking tremble in. But from Sonic Monolith, this was my introduction to the band when they were announced they were coming to my town. Um, the, the, the the debut album, always debut albums were always kind of hard to kind of surpass their later material. But the debut album does the justice to tell you guys what Ape Vermin is all about. And then of course their EP, this was released like somewhere in 2021 around there if my memory serves correct. Um, just a little funny piece that the guys did, and I think Megalith of Echoes is like the longest song, close to like, uh, maybe 8 minutes, 12 minutes in length around there, somewhere around there. But if you have the time, listen to it. And then of course the latest album that came out uh, recently, uh, Colossus, what a trip in its own. This album might be actually be a contender for the 2024 albums of the year, and um... This is spacey, takes you on a different world, uh, such amazing heavy songs, like I mentioned before. Uh, favorite song of the album is kind of hard because I like all of them, from Colony to Awakening, Motherload, uh, Oblivion, Imminent. Again, if you have not heard of Ape Vermin, give these guys a listen. You will become a great fan of them. And get their merch. If they're, they come to your town, give them a listen. Say hello, get their fucking merch. They're fucking heavy as hell. Billie Eilish, Hit Me Hard and Soft. This is her third studio album. And uh, yeah, some people might be shocking that I actually like Billie Eilish. I really 
like Billy Ash. Especially since Alicia got me more into them, so got me more into her. So for that, thank you, Alicia, for getting me into her. But um, I like Billie Eilish. I mean, I like her sound. I like her songs. I like her style. I like what she sings about. And uh, this album, like the title says, "Hit Me Hard and Sub," has songs that are kind of synth wave, poppy, heavy at times. We have a song like "The Grave," which is my favorite song of the album. A ballad of ballads where she sings so softly, and then that guitar at the very end, oh, it hits me right in the heart. And this edition is an edition. This is the the special edition that uh, Alicia and I got in in the at her website. It comes with the splatter. A uh, little saying that she's a uh, Billy splatter herself, and um, it goes for a big amount of price that I'm not sure why a lot of people pay that much for. I mean, then again, if you're a big Billy Eilish fan, and I think this is only sold and for the states, so if you're an Eilish fan from another country, I do get why you want to spend more than you should on this album, but. You know, the, she, she, this is probably her best work so far. And she has a lot of great songs song from Skinny, Lunch. If you read the lyrics of what that song is about, you'll be like, damn. <laughs> uh, the Dinner, uh, Birds of a Feather, Chichidio. That song is a great song to put on when you're driving at night. It's a great song, especially the music video. I love the music video. Like I said, I love Billie Eilish as a whole. It just sucks that she didn't announce the tour in the in Texas, which hopefully that changes sooner rather than later. But another one of those albums that might be my 2024 albums of the year contenders. But again, don't ask me for liking Billie Eilish. Even though I like the most brutal evil stuff, I can like other stuff too. Who says you can like other stuff? To send me a rule book where that says, you know. But uh, even I listen to Billie Eilish, I would recommend this album to be kind of your first introduction to Billie Eilish. But yeah, give her a listen, you will fucking love it. Black Sabbath with Volume Four, of course, it's the fourth studio album from the most notable, the great, one of the greatest, the metal band that started heavy metal. To be honest, and um, I've been slowly getting. All of the Black Sabbath albums that I'm missing. I'm still missing a couple more albums. I still want to get in their discography. But Volume 4. From the transition from Manchester Reality to Volume 4. Or this album. They were coked out of their fucking minds. I mean. When you have a song called Snowblind. Which originally was supposed to be the name of Volume 4. But the record executives and Warner Brothers at the 11th hour were like. Yeah. We don't want you to put that as the album. As the album title. Thankfully, the song was still in the album, and of course, it's still a fucking great song. It's fucking Black Sabbath. Tony Iommi's ribs are heavy as hell. Ozzy's vocals are always winning you know, like a fucking banshee. Geezer on the bass, slapping that bass like crazy. Bill Ward on drum, just going hard as fuck. And then again, they were on coke that much the entire time. I think they recorded this album in... John Lennon's, either John Lennon's house where the story goes that they had a boxes, like cereal boxes, and they had a, a table in the middle and just pulled all the fucking coke, and they were like, oh my god, so much coke, but besides that, uh, songs are great against Snowblind, Changes, of course, being the ballad of the album, which at, at this time, Black Sabbath was also experimenting with different instruments, of course, adding keyboards, which eventually will follow up into albums like later, like uh, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath, Heaven and Hell, or even some of the Tony Martin stuff in the future. Um, Line with Sunrise, FX to Two Instrumentals, um, Under the Sun, a great album closer, Cornucopia, fucking boss, heavy as hell. I mean, for a lot of people who like the Aussie era stuff, Volume 4 gets a lot of praise for what it is. And for good reason, because it's fucking Black Sabbath. If you have not listened to Black Sabbath, what the hell are you doing here? But for a normal day, like a day like this, like a rainy day, Volume 4 kind of puts the thinning. And yeah, no Black Sabbath. Cradle Phil, Dusk and Her Embrace. This is the second studio album. From one of the pioneers of, at the beginning, Cradle of Phil's, they weren't really, okay, hear me out. 
Cradle of Filth, when they started, they were sort of black metal. And they were associated with the Norwegian black metal scene that was happening in the 90s. With the church rings and all that. At the time, they were the closest thing that Britain had to, I guess, sort of their Norwegian kind of way. Without, you know, not uh, counting Venom, which Venom were the godfathers of black metal. But Cradle of Filth at its toe at the time, they still, to me personally hadn't found their sound onto Cruelty and the Beast two years later. That's where I believe Cradle of Filth really began to be Cradle of Filth. But the sophomore effort still mixing with black metal, a lot of gothic elements. Um, I mean, if you've seen Cradle of Filth like, like I have, they have a lot of stage presence, theatrics, blood, gore, beauty. Um, like I said, even, even the album covers are sort of kind of beautiful. And um, this was actually sort of one of my very first introductions to Cradle of Filth. I think it was the song uh, Malice to the Looking Glass that got me into more of a Cradle of Filth sound. And then I, when I was at the record shop in San Antonio, I was like, I don't have this album. And I got it and it's better than I remember uh, from A Gothic Romance, The Haunting Shores. Heaven tore asunder. Yeah, I do see the argument that either you like Cradle of Filth or Demo Bulgear. I'm more of a Cradle fan, but I sort of at times like Demo at times. But I do see the point that a lot of people say about uh, Danny's vocals that they can't get into because it's always like a wah, wah, like screaming, high pitched baby kind of thing. But you know, it's Cradle of Filth for gothic metal, for at the time black metal, for. I guess symphonic black metal, if I dare say so myself. Pretty good album, but uh, doesn't compare to later albums like Cruelty and the Beast, which to me, it is their best album. Their, I guess, the album that kind of solidified their sound. Then again, Million also kind of falls into, into that realm. But um, Dusk and Hair and Brains, for someone who wants to kind of start at the beginning of Cradle of Filth, kind of a novel that I would recommend and um yeah that's credible this member like in Everflory stream the course is the debut album for one of the pioneers of Swedish death metal alongside in two grave and um I always keep forgetting the other one unleash um yeah I uh, for the longest time I never had this member and I always said if I didn't get into left hand path first like an ever-flowing stream will be kind of like the second album I would leave with my choice. It's always a debate between Left Hand Pad and like an ever-flowing stream, but honestly, to be honest, Left Hand Pad always wins, and this is like a, a big runner-up, but again, this is released in 91 at the peak of that movement, and just look at that, guys. I mean, how much, how brutal can you get? Look how young they were, covered in fucking blood. How much metal can you get than that? Of course, with the upside down cross. Nice one, guys. Nice one. And the fact that they're actually coming to San Antonio in like a little festival, I actually might go see them live and see the K. Sign my city. I'm not sure yet, but hopefully I might have my change set. But yeah, I mean, Swedish Jazz Metal masterpiece. Uh, man, this album is so fucking good. And the fact that uh, I always keep forgetting this band's member that was entombed. Uh, give me just a second. Uh, Nick Anderson. Yeah, Nick Anderson, who was at the time, I think, the drummer for um, Entombed, actually had a was lead guitars in the album except for one track, and he actually created the logo. So kind of a bit of a brotherhood between Entombed and this member, but. One of the greatest Swedish death metal albums of all time. Hell, one of the one kind of descending the way into what a melodic death metal could potentially be. Songs like Soon to the Dead, uh, In Dead Sleep, and the fact that this edition has two bonus tracks, uh, Death Vocation and The Physicy Decay, which were later added into the album as the official album, but there were two bonus tracks. Um, Skin Her Alive, uh, again, Brutality at its finest, but with melodics and the vocals, again, typical late, early 90s underground uh, death metal vocals, and um, yeah, the album artwork, one of the best album artworks you can ever find, and yeah, 
If you want to get into Swedish death metal, this alongside Blood Pan Pad is your way to go. Gojira from Mars to Sirius. This is the third studio album from one of the most modern, progressive metal bands out there in the world. Of course, they're coming from France. And I remember me getting into a lot of heavier stuff. Gojira was one of those bands that fucked me up in a good way because I never thought that Gojira was a band that had so much technicality yet beauty and heaviness. I mean, of course, the, the, the name Gojira already alone made me want to listen to it being that Godzilla in Japanese. And the, the artwork and the lyrics, what they sing about is even more amazing that they're they try to send a message through their lyrics, through their songs about the environment and animals and how we're supposed to take care of the planet and everything like that, activism. And when you have a song like uh, The Heaviest Matter in the Universe, that song can fuck you up so hard that it'll make you offend automatically. The guitar is great, the drums, everything about it is perfection. In terms of Gojira, as a band as a whole, they don't have bad albums. Every single album is different. Every single album is a trip in its own. Every single album is a masterpiece. But personally, to me, From Mars to Sirius is their, uh, the, their best work they've done so far. I could be wrong. If you guys have a, have a different opinion about Gojira, let me know in the comments. But even from the artwork, I mean, come on, even the artwork, you gotta admit, it's fucking amazing. Um, Global Warming, um, of course, from Mars to Sirius, the two songs combining to one. Again, everything about Gojira is amazing that if you have not seen Gojira, I would love to see Gojira live. I know my buddy Levi saw Gojira live. I think he saw Gojira live with Mastodon a year, two years ago, which uh, I'm so fucking jealous he did that, but... Uh, yeah, Mars to Sirius, an album, a, a tribute song that will make you get more Gojira, which I'll probably get more Gojira in the future, but yeah, hell Gojira. Virtual 11 from Iron Maiden, this is of course their 11th studio album. You don't need to have an introduction to who Iron Maiden are, if you're a metal fan, you know who Iron Maiden is. This is of course, this is their second album with Blaze Bailey under the vocals, and um, a lot of people shit on the Blaze Bailey era with the X back in the Virtual Eleven. Yeah, it's not the Diano era. Yeah, I know it's not the Bruce Dickinson stuff, but give Blaze Bailey a break, people. He did with what he could with what he was given during the late nineties, which at the time the nineties for a lot of modern, uh, quote unquote, heavy metal bands, it was like the death of them because the underground was surpassing, brunch was a new thing, alternative metal was happening. New man, what's happening? So give him a break. But Virtual Eleven has gets a lot of shit, and after listening to it, it has aged well. I mean, I've said it before. I'll say it again. To me, the Iron Maiden doesn't have bad albums. They have okay to great to phenomenal to masterpieces. And from the Blaze Billy era, I kind of put those to the very bottom. But it doesn't mean it's a bad album. It's still a great album. We have a song that the Clansman, which Iron Maiden, the last time I saw them live, was in 2019 at the Legacy of the Beast tour. They actually put that song on their set list, being that this is still, and there's still a demand for the Blaze Baileys. And the fact that they actually had the Digipacks, which these Digipacks are actually pretty good. I've been wanting to get the rest of the discography slowly but surely. And there's some pretty great. Um, Como Estas Amigo, a ballad to end the album. It's amazing. Uh, uh, the Angel and the Gambler, yeah, that chorus goes on forever. Don't forget, I'm a savior. Don't forget, now I take your life. I'm like, please, please, say, sing something else, for fuck's sake. That chorus goes on for like half or even 75% of the album, of the song, but... And that music video, that music video sucked. Ah, that's, uh, that was not a great music video, but regardless of that, Give the Blaze Bailey era another listen. You might have, you might find some hidden gems. I personally found the hidden gems in Virtual Eleven, and hopefully, I can get the X Factor so I can finally have the Blaze Bailey of Iron Maiden, which even at times Iron Maiden kind of forgets about it. But the fact that they did the digipack for the album, 
and they put one of the songs of the place below in their set list. Kind of says a lot. Hopefully they sing more songs. I would love for Maiden to sing more songs out of those two albums. Who knows, maybe when I see them in for the second time in November, that might change. But yeah, Virtual Eleven, okay album, but it's fucking Iron Maiden. Motorhead, Ace of Spades, of course, their fourth studio album. And for a lot of people, their most notable album because of Ace of Spades' a song, which that song alone is one of the greatest metal songs of all time, one of the best anthems of all time. And I finally have it in the collection. I don't know why it took me forever to get it. I don't know why whenever I go to the record store or go online, I always forget to fucking buy it. But I finally have it in the collection. And yeah, a lot of people only know the album because of Ace of Speeds, the song. But if you go deep into the album, we have songs like The Hammer, We Are The Roll Crew, that song, man. Jailbait, Fight The Bullet, Fast and Loud, Live To Win. Motorhead is one of those bands that unfortunately I never had the opportunity to see live. And of course, you have the classic lineup of Lemmy, Phil's if you're Animal Tater, and Fast Daily Clark, which it's kind of shocking to think that they're all, they're all gone. You know, first from Lemmy and then Phil C. Phil and then Eddie Clark. And it's a shame that still to this day, they're not in the fucking Hall of Fame, which is kind of weird. Uh, but uh, Motorhead, one of the greatest bands of all time, one of the greatest albums, Aces Wits of all time. And um, I need to get more Motorhead in the collection in the future, but hell, Motorhead, hell, fucking let me. My Dying Bride, A Mortal Binding. This is their 14th studio album and their latest studio album released in 2024. Of course, me being a big Death Do fan and a big My Dying Bride, of course, I was going to listen to the album and automatically get the album. And from expecting lately, the band has been sort of transcending back into their a bit of the modern sound with the gothic metal and bringing back the growls in, in Alan's department of kind of bringing the more of a growling kind of old death doom vibe mixing with the, with the gothic metal and the melodics and the violin into what it's essentially now the sound of my dying bride this album at the beginning i had uh sort of doubts about it because i think the first single that they released which was um throwback him i think it was the first single they released i was kind of iffy about it but after re-listening to like three times five times I kind of dig it and then the whole album came out and to me this album kind of is a whole departure from the ghost of orion which can believe that album was released four years ago i thought that in this album the band is more angry more focused because the ghost of orion was a bit of a grief album especially you know the backstory behind uh some of the songs and i believe that this album they kind of went back into a angrier kind of space in their lives and you can kind of tell from the instruments they're played um aaron's vocals you can kind of tell the delivery that he delivers the 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 songs uh personally my favorite song of the album is probably a starving heart melody doom Kali masterpiece to me that's what i one of my top maybe one of my absolute favorite my dying bride uh, songs actually but don't sleep on just those singles. Listen to the rest of the album, like her Dominion, the second of three bells. I thought that I was gonna be a phenomenal album, a phenomenal song, which turned out to be a great song. Uh, the Apocalyptic, which is the longest song they on the album, close to like, I think close to 11, 11 minutes, close to 12 minutes around there. But overall, in terms of my Dying Bride albums, if I were to rank my Dying Bride, which I need to do that. I need to do a My Dying Bride ranking in the future. Let me know down in the comments if you want me to rank My Dying Bride. I would probably put this a bit higher in the middle. Of course, it doesn't come close to albums like Turn Loose of Swans or like Gods of the Sun or, you know, stuff like that. But it is a great album to listen to and probably an album I would probably recommend a new My Dying Bride fan to get into because you get mostly all of the modern My Dying Bride sounds, but you get some of the old school sound. And once you get into the album, you kind of go back and listen to the older material and kind of 
feel more connected to the to the sound that my dying bride has been portraying for the past 15 years or so and hopefully they come to the states i would love to see my dying bride live and hopefully that comes to this and yeah my dying bride fucking amazing out oh. So that's pretty much gonna do from this uh, part. Uh, like as I mentioned before, I have another stack of CDs that will be revealing in the next CD collection update. And hope you guys really enjoyed the video. Um, let me know down in the comments what was your favorite album that I talked about in this video. Uh, let me know which other albums I should get because I have so many albums I have yet to get that I always forget to go and get them whenever I go to the record store or on eBay or on Amazon or on Discogs. And there's so much stuff I still need to get and hopefully to grow my collection to eventually reaching 500 CDs, which at the time of the recording, I'm currently at like close to 440. And hopefully the next milestone being 500 CDs is close, closer rather than later. Um, thank you so much for watching. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, do all of that stuff on my Instagram. And yeah, like I mentioned before, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay safe, everyone, and until next time, stay metal.